Welcome to Woodland Valley Church. Glad you can join us tonight in our journey through the book of Revelation. If you'd like to follow along, you can look at our website, www.woodlandvalley.org. You can download material and you can walk with us through the book of Revelation. All right, I want to welcome you again here tonight. Let's go to the Lord for a moment of prayer and we'll get started. Father, we thank you so very much for this day. We thank you for your book. I ask, Lord, that you would uh, help us to, to understand what you have to say to us tonight, Lord, when it comes to facing adversity. The Church of Philadelphia, Lord, dealt with so much adversity and they came through in the end. Help us to learn a lesson from this incredible church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so we are in the church of, at the Church of Philadelphia. We are in Revelation chapter 3, beginning in verse 7. But before we get into it, I want to I read you a story. I think some of you may have heard me read this for you before, but there was a daughter who complained to her father about how hard things were for her, okay? And she said, as soon as I solve one problem, another one pops up. I'm tired of struggling. Her father, who was a chef, took her to the kitchen where he filled three pots of water and placed each on a high fire. Soon the pots came to a boil, and one he placed carrots, and a second he placed eggs, and in the last he placed ground coffee beans. And he let them simmer and boil without saying a word. The daughter was impatient, but she waited, wondering what he was doing. After a while, he went over and turned off the burners. He fished out the carrots, placed them in a bowl. He put the eggs, uh, took the eggs out, put them in a bowl, and he poured coffee into a coffee mug. Okay. Turning to her, he asked, he said, sweetheart, what do you see? She replied, kind of aggravated, carrots, eggs, and coffee. And he brought her closer and, and asked her to feel the carrots, and she did, and she noticed they were soft. Then he said, then he told her to take the egg and break it. And after pulling up the shell, she observed it was a hard-boiled egg. Finally, he asked her to sip the coffee, and she smiled at the taste of the rich flavor. She asked, oh, Dad, what does it all mean? And he explained that each of them faced the same adversity, boiling water, but each reacted differently. The carrots went in strong, hard, and unrelenting, but after being subjected to the boiling water, they softened and became weak. The egg was fragile. Its thin outer shell had protected its uh, in interior, but after sitting through the boiling water, uh, its inside hardened. The ground coffee beans were unique, however. By being in the boiling water, they changed the water. The father then asked the daughter, when adversity strikes, which one are you? It's a great story. Uh, we all face differences in adversity, but we all face adversity in this world. We all face different challenges and different struggles. And of course, it's easy to say, well, my struggles are worse than your struggles. Are, or you, you don't know how I'm dealing. You don't know what I'm going through. And that is true. We really don't fully know what each person's going through. Uh, but I have heard it said by, by people in the past that if, if all of us could put our lives in a suitcase, everybody in the world, throw it in a big pile, walk around and randomly reach in and pull out a suitcase, we'd all want our own suitcase back, regardless of what we got. Because everybody has struggles. Everybody's facing difficulties and adversity. It's how we deal with it that determines our success. Okay? And that's kind of what's going on here. Let's take a look at the Church of Philadelphia, a church that faced major adversity. In chapter 3, verse 7, uh, it says, And to the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, he that shutteth and no man openeth. So we consider the, uh, uh, before we consider the character of Christ, you got, keep in mind, only two churches did not receive any condemnation at all. Philadelphia and Smyrna. God had nothing negative to say about either one of those churches. No rebuke. And it's interesting that those were the two churches that were experiencing adversity from severe persecution. So the two churches that were experiencing adversity from persecution were the only two churches that were uh, uh, not reprimanded for something. The other churches kind of had it a little easier. And they fell into sin. Now, does that mean that we should seek adversity? No, but also, we also need to understand adversity has its purpose in the lives of a believer. Okay? All right, so we see he's, uh, uh, Jesus has spoken of, there's not a lot of imagery here. 
like with the other ones. And this one is just called Holy and True. Holy and True. And I believe, I think, as I read through this, that's how Christ is, is encouraging this church that's facing persecution, saying, you're following the Holy and True One. You're, you're okay. You're okay. All right? But there's one more de description here. And it, uh, he's described, Jesus is described as the one with the key of David. The key of David and an open door. And this goes back to Isaiah 22. Uh, Eliakim was given uh, the key to the house of David. Okay? Uh, king Hezekiah was king. And the governor of the house was a man by the name of Sheba. Or Shebna, sorry, Shebna. S H E B. B and A. And he was the governor of the king's palace. But Hezekiah caught him doing something he wasn't supposed to be doing. Shebna was only, he had the key, he was the one that was in charge of allowing people to come into the presence of the king. And King Hezekiah found out that Shebna was only letting in his friends and people that agreed with his ideology. And that was not what his job was supposed to be. So uh, Shebna was uh, exiled to Babylon. In his place, Eliakim was made governor. And Eliakim was given the key to the house of David, which means he now had the authority to allow anyone he wanted in to see the king. And that's where this picture comes from. Jesus has the key of the house of David, figuratively speaking, spiritually speaking, He's the only one, as we remember from John chapter 14, verse 6. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Jesus has the key. Jesus is the way to the Father. And, but it's just kind of neat how this picture from thousands of years earlier kind of lays the foundation for something that's going to kind of take place figuratively later on. It's just a neat, a neat and beautiful picture. So what is the, what is the commendation that he gives to them? Well, verse 8 says, uh, Jesus says to them, I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door that no man shuts, uh, for thou hast a little strength and hast kept my word and hast not denied my name. This is a beautiful picture. He's saying, even though you only have a little strength remaining, you held on to my word. You've been faithful to my word. You've been faithful to my name. You have persevered. Even though you're small, the Church of Philadelphia was probably a little tiny church, maybe not even a... Um, uh, uh, back during that time, there were a number of different types of churches. There were home churches that were typically a little bit smaller, and there were kind of bigger centralized churches uh, that were kind of for the whole city, uh, kind of. This was a little church with little strength and seemingly little impact, but God said, no, I want you to understand your looks are deceiving. You are actually quite strong. Your perseverance is incredible. Uh, <laughs> I heard one preacher when he was going through this section, uh, he used the story of two dogs that were talking to each other. A Great Dane that was huge and a little chihuahua. Any of you dog people? You're a dog person, all right. What kind of dog do you have? Oh, I have four dogs. Oh. You are a dog person. Okay. You know, you know Great Danes. They're, you can ride them like horses. We have a lab and we have a uh, spearhead. She's like a big white polar bear. Mm. And we have a spearhead. And she's a Get a little tiny one. The illustration he used was similar to that. He had a Great Dane and a Chihuahua. And they're talking to each other. And the Great Dane, of course, is big and powerful and strong. And he's kind of showing off. And, and, and the little Chihuahua... Uh, says, you know, I, I, I can, I can, I'm just as, as good as you. I'm just as strong as you. And the Great Dane laughed and he said, and the Great Dane said, uh, oh, the, the Charles said, I, I bet you I can get the master to come faster than you. Now they were outside of a gate and the, you know, the Great Dane looks at him and says, you can't even reach the, 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 the handle to the gate. What are you talking about? And he starts, starts smack talking him. Well, they started a little contest. And the Great Dane was first. So the Great Dane kind of got up on his two uh, back legs and he's messing with the handle, messing with the handle and, and with a lot of effort and a lot of, a lot of energy. And, and he finally gets it open and he opens the door and goes in and then the master comes out. It's about five minutes. Okay. 
gets out there and he says, ah, five minutes, let's see you beat that. So the chihuahua goes up to the door and starts yipping and yapping and scratching like crazy on the door. After about 20 seconds, the master comes up to get him to stop doing it. He said, see, I'm just as good as you. It's, it doesn't matter how big the dog is, okay? God says, y y Philadelphia, you're a tiny little church, but ah, you've kept my name. You've kept the good doctrine. You're fighting the good fight. Your perseverance has made you great and mighty. Revelation chapter 3, verses 9 and 10 says this, Behold, I will make them, I will make of them, in other words, uh, uh, the, he's going to be start, he's starting to talk about the, the persecution now. I will make of them the synagogue of Satan, which they, they are Jews but are not, uh, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet. And I know that I have loved thee, uh, and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept my word and my patience, I also will keep, my, keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon the whole world to try them. This is an, an important passage here. Okay? So, the synagogue of Satan, that's a, that was a Jewish gathering that had rejected Jesus Christ as Messiah, and um, they, were, they were persecuting the, these, these people, this church, right? And then Jesus makes a statement. He says, I'm going to keep you from the hour of trial that is coming upon the whole world. What do you think he's talking about there? What is this period of trial you think he's talking about? Hmm. Tribulation. Now, here's a, here's a big key to why we teach a pre-trib rapture. The Church of Philadelphia doesn't exist anymore. It hasn't existed in 1900 years, practically. 1800 years. So, obviously, he's talking to not just a specific church, but this message is to the churches throughout time, who do what? Do what it says here in verse 8, um, keep my word and not deny my name. Those are those that, the people that are, that are saved, that know the Lord. Uh, this part of the world history that we're going to be coming up to in a couple of, a couple of weeks here when we get back together, um, is uh, it will be unparalleled in all of human history, the amount of human suffering that's going to take place during the tribulation period. It's described in Revelation chapter 6 through 19. And chapter 6 through 19, the church isn't mentioned one time, but the tribulation period is, is, is expounded upon and explained throughout the, the whole, that whole portion. Okay? Throughout history, God has always delivered his people from utter destruction. Always. You go back to um, Esther, right? God delivered his people miraculously through Queen Esther. You go to, you, you look at any, you look at the judges period. When, when, when Israel was being oppressed and they were just about ready to give up hope, he would raise up a judge and the judge would deliver them and bring them back to where they were supposed to be. Noah protected them, delivered them out of the, the, the final tribulation. In the tribulation, the great tribulation period, God is going to deliver us out of that before it even begins to exist. Now people say, yeah, but what about those that get saved during the tribulation? We're going to talk about that when we get there, but it seems, there's, a, there's a certain covering of protection for them as well that we'll, we'll unpack as we get there. Okay? So he, he makes this promise, this incredible promise. Because you've kept my word, because you haven't denied my name, this is what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to deliver you. I'm going to keep you from the hour of trial, from the hour of tribulation. Verse 11, he goes on and says, Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, uh, that no man take thy crown. All right, this is a pretty powerful portion of Scripture here. When, we, when he says, I come quickly. And here we are 2,000 years later, or 1,900 years later. What does that mean? Did God lie? Did he make a mistake? What did we look at? What, what, what do we know about the word quickly? It's in his time, absolutely. And God doesn't gauge time the same way we do, right? As a matter of fact, 
Uh, Dwayne, I'm going to pick on you just a drop. You are, how old are you, sir? 64. John, you are 10. Okay. Guaranteed, John looks at time different than you do at this point in life, right? For you, Christmas probably comes and goes like that. And, and you know, what, we're at Christmas already? It just seemed like it was yesterday. And time, not to say that you're old, but you're older than him. Time seems to go faster the older you get. Your, your picture of it changes. John, Christmas doesn't happen for another five years for him. Okay? <laughs> uh, but for you, it's like, oh, man, just see the great Christmas. I'm like that, too. When we come around to Christmas thinking, didn't we, didn't we just do our Christmas service a couple weeks ago? <laughs> Sometimes it feels that fast. People perceive time differently, but God, being outside of time and space, definitely per, uh, uh, sees it very differently. Remember, when God created the heavens and the earth, think of, um, let's do a geometry lesson, okay? In geometry, you've got a number of different symbols. Okay, that's a line. Um, this is a vector, right? Starts in a point and goes on. Array. Array. What's a vector? I don't know either. Okay, but then there's, there's one more, right? Right, it goes on both ways. Okay, we, oh, and then, oh, there's also a point. Okay, we see time like this. We're in a point. We can think about what's going to take place we can remember about what happened, but we exist in a point. So if you put us, wherever you put us, if you put us here, if you put us here, if you put us here, wherever you put us, that's how we perceive time. So for us, quickly is right here, right here, and right here. That's quickly. God is outside of time, and he has created a box of time within eternity. So he's put a line inside of, we don't know what this is. I forgot what this is called. Any, any geometrists in here? <laughs> okay. He, it may be just considered a line. I don't know. It goes so both ways. Both um, on this, God has carved out us, time for us. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's not when everything started, though. He existed in eternity past. He will exist forevermore. For us, this block is, you know, 40, 50, 60, 80, 100 years. For God, that's... So his version of quickly... Is, his version of time is very different, like Dwayne was saying. But also, the word itself quickly means suddenly, unexpectedly, and without announcement. It means rapidly. So in other words, he's just talking about the tribulation, the hour of tribulation. Once it begins, it will be very, it, it, for one, it'll come on suddenly. There's not going to be a lot to tell us, hey, guess what's coming? It's going gonna, it's gonna to come. And everything that needs to take place has taken place on, on a on a massive scale, prophetically, okay? Prophetically. So, but once it begins, once the tribulation period begins, it's going to be a rapid succession. Think about it. Right now we have around 7 billion people on the planet. Okay? The rapture alone is going to change the entire face of the earth. Let's say there's Let's say there's only a billion people who know the Lord. There's probably more, but let's say there's only a billion. You subtract a billion people from the earth, instantly the world changes completely. Literally, overnight. Then in the course of the next uh, seven years, you know, you got six billion people left. Uh, the first set of um, judgments uh, wipe out or eliminate or judge a fourth of them and then the next one's a third of what's left over and then the, uh, the last one it, it takes out everybody but those that are, have been saved in the tribulation all in seven years so in seven years you go from seven billion down to whatever's left at the end of the tribulation whoever's saved and makes it through the tribulation period a few million maybe don't know but we do know that 
What, what's a quarter of six? She's going to tell me right now. A quarter of six billion is? So we track, subtract 1.5 from 6, and what do we got? 4.5. All right, 4.5. Now, this is, going to kind of, this is going to be kind of neat. You take a, a third away from that. Another 1.5. 1. 1. All right, 1.5, which lives, lives with what? 2, right? Three, that's what I meant. Three. So that all happens in the first three and a half years. First three and a half years, you go from seven billion, more than half the population of the earth, in three and a half years. Think about that. That is rapid succession. And then we go from three billion to whoever's left that's actually saved, which we don't know. We don't know that number, okay? But everybody that is unsaved at that point, at those last judgments, are gone at the you know the, culminating in the Battle of Armageddon, or the battles of Armageddon. So quickly he says, "Behold, I come quickly." Meaning, when I come, it's going to be sudden. It's going to be rapid. There's not going to be a lot of warning. So I'm telling you right now, just like he talks about this this thief in the night. A thief doesn't call up and say, "Hey, Sarah, guess what? I'm coming over tonight. I'm going to rob you blind. Just letting you know ahead of time." No, that's not what they do. Okay, it's sudden. It's it, it, it's, it's right there, okay? The Bible, the New Testament teaches the imminent, which means that's what's going to happen next, return of Christ, okay? And um, 1 John 2, 28 says this, And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and be not ashamed before him at his coming. So what does that mean? Well, some people will say, hey, if, uh, if, if, the, if the, the world's almost done, if Christ is coming back soon, then why even bother? I'm saved, I'm going to heaven, why bother? Well, I've had a lot of jobs growing up, and I've noticed a lot of things about people during those jobs. When the boss is on the site, people work hard. When the boss is gone, they kind of slack. And what's the, what's the old saying? When, when the, the cat's away, the mice will play, right? I don't want God coming and seeing me playing. I want him to see me doing what he's called me to do. That's what we should be. That's the encouragement that he gives to this church. That's the encouragement that he's giving to us, okay? He talks about the crowns, that no man take away your crown. It's an interesting picture. The crowns come from here. 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that we th what he has done, whether it be good or bad. Now remember, we've talked about this before. We'll talk about it again in a little while. Um, there's a couple of different judgments that we've got to be aware of. One is the judgment seat of Christ. Is that judge? How do you spell Judgment. No E, right? right? Judgment seat or the Bema seat. Okay, it's the judgment seat of Christ. And then there's the, uh, the great white throne. Okay. Big difference in the two of these judgments. What's this one talking about? Judgment seat. Bema seat. Okay. This is a, a, a judgment for the saved. It's based on rewards. It's a rewards based. And it's, it pictures the, the Olympic Games back then. <clears throat> or or any, of the, any of the games. When there were games going on, the, not, no, not always the emperor, but if it, was, if it was in Rome, obviously the emperor would be it. But whoever was the ruler of that section, or that, that countryside, where they would build up this platform and they would call it the Bema seat. They'd put a seat on top of it. That was, that was the Bema seat. And the winners of the race would come by and he would give them crowns as their reward. Okay? So that's what we're talking about here. The great white throne is for the unsaved. Okay? And it's, it's 
uh, uh, it's, it's based on works, and it's not rewards. It's, it's, a, um, it's punishment. Punishment. This is at the end of the millennial reign. This is probably at the beginning of the millennial reign, but we'll talk about that when we get to it. So two different judgments. What is, what is he telling to the church here? He's saying, hold fast, that way nobody takes away your crown. Uh, what's he trying to say? He's trying to say, hey, while you're alive, be working my work. That way there is a reward waiting for you in heaven. You're going to get to heaven, but I've heard people say, ah, oh, I'll be satisfied with just standing on the outskirts of heaven, and I'll be okay with that. I'm not okay with that. I want to be as close to Christ as I possibly can. I want to be able to hear the words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I want to be able to be, if God raptured us right now, <clears throat> I would want to be able to look at him and not hide my face in, in shame because, oh, I didn't do what you asked me to do. Now, of course, none of us are perfect. None of us are going to have everything right. But he, what, he's, what he's telling this church is, don't give up. You're being persecuted. You're being, you're being hunted. You're being... Uh, um, but you're, you're persevering so far. Don't stop persevering. Don't stop doing what I've called you to do. And honestly, sometimes that can be hard. You know, we live in a world where our ideology isn't as popular as the ideology of the world. Our ideology or our doctrine or our way of life is not as well received as some of the stuff going on in the world. And we could take some persecution. We could take some heat from that. And we could easily get to a point of saying, "What is it worth it? God says here to this church, it's worth it. Don't stop. Don't give up. Okay? All right. Let's go to the Lord for a moment of prayer and close out the evening here. Father, we thank you so very much for giving us uh, this church as a, as a model Help us, uh, Father, one, to be revived, and two, <clears throat> to continue to work the work that you sent us here to do. Lord, we love you so very much. We come to you in Jesus' name. Amen. We are really glad you were able to join us tonight in our study through the book of Revelation. If you happen to live in the Mars area and like to join us on a Sunday morning, you can come and visit us at 225 Crow Ave, Mars, Pennsylvania, or you can check us out on the website, www.woodlandvalley.org. But if you live near a local church and you're already plugged in, I would encourage you to continue to do so. And you can use us as a, an additional resource to help you in your study through the scripture.